Hi, I'm Laura de Molière and I am Head of Behavioural Science at the UK Government's Cabinet Office. I eat, sleep and breathe behavioural science. Ever since I have been a teenager, I have been utterly obsessed with psychology. So much so that after a bit of begging, my school actually allowed me to attend university lectures instead of some school lessons. And my love for the field has only grown once I started to actually properly study psychology at university and do my PhD in cognitive decision sciences. I started at this point also to consult applied behavioral science projects throughout the globe and have been utterly in love with the field since. What I find so fascinating about behavioral science, and I have always found this and it's still true today, is that whenever you are faced with a wicked problem, be this social mobility, climate change, COVID, or tackling violence against women and girls, once you start to look at this problem through the lens of concrete behaviors, so once you start thinking about what are the behaviors that actually constitute this problem, who are all the actors that are involved? What could they be doing to solve the problem? Once you start doing that, a whole new world opens to you and suddenly you see the problem in high resolution. Because most problems are caused by and solved by humans, I think that I've yet to come across a policy or communications challenge where behavioral science can't contribute. And it's for that reason, I think, that behavioral science is relevant to problem solvers across the globe. What I want to share with you is some of my story of behavioral science, my lessons learned and the opportunities that I think there are for the field going forward. So I founded the behavioral science team in the UK government's cabinet office, where I work with incredibly talented people on some of the most complex challenges that we face to date. You see, there is not one way of practicing behavioral science. Usually there is an expectation that behavioral science comes with nudges, small changes in someone's environment, like putting a fly in a urinal so that men have something to aim for and there's less spillage, or smart wording changes. Behavioral science is also often actually associated with randomized control trials. For me, the most important thing when it comes to behavioral science is actually to make sure it addresses an organizational need. In my case, there are so many marketers who are really able to word a message and so many analysts who can run a randomized control trial. What was missing was the ability to really analyze problems from a behavioral perspective. That is answering questions like, what behaviors are we seeing at the moment? Why are they a problem for a policy? What kind of behaviors would we want to see instead? Why are people not doing them already? And what is it that we could do to help design an intervention or a policy or a communication that can help overcome these barriers to achieve behavior change? The other thing you'll actually often see with behavioral science is that the way it is marketed is around us being able to identify all the irrational behaviors and cognitive biases that humans might have. I purposely stepped away from this kind of language and approach. That's for many different reasons, but one of the core ones is that the key of behavioral science is actually to help you empathize with, with your target audience. If I hear someone describe behavior as irrational, usually it just tells me that they've not understood the current person's context well enough. And we know that there are so many different influences on human behavior Cognitive biases are only such a small part that overly focusing on it might mean we miss something else that's really big. Finally, for me, setting up a team, one of my core visions is that behavioral science is made accessible to everyone. Because the end game for me can't be that we have small teams sitting in organizations, in the end, impacting only a fraction of all the problems that we could help solve. For me, the end point has to be that actually we change the way problems are approached. And to me, this meant that when building capability in an organization, I don't focus on teaching people all the fancy effects and biases or about often actually misunderstood things like loss aversion or optimism bias. 
Because in reality, people find it interesting, but they'll end up forgetting it. It doesn't really change the way they work. What I focused on instead was to try and change the system with small steps to make sure that all campaigns had a clear behavioral objective. And it's that point where I can then teach people about frameworks that they can apply to understand barriers in their context. So as a result, I've done quite a lot of R&D work with my team to help everyone think like a behavioral scientist. Now I've told you a little bit about the way I've set up my team and some of the past, but I think there's so much more exciting things that will be happening in the future with behavioral science. So I'm going to share three opportunities that I see at the moment. So the first opportunity I see is to broaden the scope of the kinds of decisions behavioral science impacts. Because what happens a lot at the moment is that behavioral science is sort of an add-on to an existing process. And whenever you have an add-on, it means you're kind of slowed down. So you might have to collect different kinds of data, you might have to set up a trial. These things are absolutely worthwhile doing. But it also means that we're sometimes cut out from other kinds of decisions. Particularly in a crisis, decisions are often made in hours. They're made at such speed. And the question that I was facing is, what can behavioral science contribute at the moment of a crisis where decisions are made so fast about lots of different kinds of behavior? And I think there are two ways in which behavioral science can contribute. The first is to actually provide a framework for how we think about the problems, which is, again, this relentless focus on behaviors. What kind of behaviors do we think people should do in this crisis? What kind of behaviors do we want to prevent? And providing early impact on how we can assess how we can drive these behaviors through an analysis of all the barriers that people might currently face. The second way in which behavioral science can impact really fast in a crisis is by correcting the assumptions that we might see decision makers make about behavior. One of the key assumptions that we see again and again and again is that decision makers think that people will panic. And there's been actually quite a lot of reviews. I think the latest one, over 500 different disasters were analyzed. And panic just isn't something we usually see. And this is important that we correct these assumptions because what happens is that if you think someone will panic, you will actually end up putting out lots of reassurance messages trying to calm down the situation sometimes at the cost of the right information that people actually need to make good decisions for themselves in this context. Behavioral science can then also actually inform people what we know about how people behave at the point of crisis. And a lot of time what we actually see are cooperation behaviors, people helping each other, supporting each other. So that means behavioral science has a chance to shift the focus on building the right infrastructure to allow for this cooperation to make sure that in a crisis, we're using people as an asset to help us solve the crisis, rather than something we have to manage. The second opportunity I see for behavioral science is to apply it to do no harm. You know, whenever you are intervening in a complex system, there will always be some sort of impacts that are hard to anticipate. And some of these impacts will come in the form of unintended behavioral consequences. And some of these unintended behaviors might actually reduce the chance of success for your intervention. And some of these behaviors might actually be in conflict with the UNICEF's human rights-based approach. They can actually really cause harm. And behavioral scientists are here with tools and frameworks to help you think about what kind of behaviors you might not anticipate and how to mitigate them. The third opportunity I see is that behavioral science will expand the kind of topics it works on. So traditionally, behavioral science is being brought in at a point where behaviors are quite concrete. That's why I think we see that behavioral science is represented really well in topics related to health, which is where you often have a quite concrete behavior, like washing your hands, getting vaccinated, and so on. Now, I'm not saying that these behaviors are easily achieved, and in fact, I think they are overrepresented because that's the point where decision makers go, oh, actually, I need a behavioral scientist to help me with this. But I do think there are lots of other topics that behavioral science should look much more closely at. 
at a point where behaviors aren't clear yet at all. Social cohesion might be one of them, or conflict. Areas where it's very much not clear what kind of behaviors we actually even could, could drive. And finally, I think we could also expand into areas like fast-moving humanitarian crises, where behavioral science has a real chance to help think about what the different user journeys are, what the actors are related to this crisis, and what kind of behaviors could help keep everyone safe and help solve it. Now, I'm really excited about the future of behavioral science, and I'm really happy to be a part of that. And I, I'm honestly so curious to see what kind of problems you'll be solving together.